Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. In this video, I'm gonna talk about drugs of the sympathetic nervous system. Remember, the sympathetic nervous system is your fight and flight response. It gets stimulated in, in times of stress to keep you alive. Now remember the neurons of the sympathetic nervous system, they exit the spinal cord at either the thoracic or lumbar region, okay, which we term the thoracolumbar region. And when they come out, they're gonna to speak to various organs and tell them to do something that should help you in times of stress. So for example, they can tell your pupils to dilate so you can get more light in, see around you. It will tell your peripheral blood vessels to constrict. That means it gets rid of the blood at the surface and pushes it deeper within your body. It can tell your heart to pump harder and faster to distribute more blood to your skeletal muscles so you can run away or fight. It does many different things. It can open your airways up so you can get more air in and out. So all these things are here to save you, okay? Now, when we look at the sympathetic nervous system, noradrenaline is the neurotransmitter that's used to speak to all these various organs or glands to activate them to have their role in the sympathetic nervous system response. So noradrenaline is produced in these sympathetic neurons. The way it's produced is tyrosine, which is an amino acid that you get from your diet, will jump into these neurons and turn ultimately into dopamine. Now dopamine, we know is that feel good molecule, but we know it does so much more. It aids in physical movement as well, amongst many other things such as reward. Now dopamine actually turns into noradrenaline. So dopamine is the precursor for noradrenaline. Noradrenaline, also known as norepinephrine if you're in the States, jumps into a vesicle. So a vesicle is a membrane bound structure that can then travel to the end of the neuron, bind and release its contents, being all that noradrenaline out in an area called the synapse. So you've got a neuron and then you've got the organ that needs to be stimulated by that neuron. It could be the heart, could be the airways, it could be the pupils, could be the peripheral blood vessels, for example. So noradrenaline is released and what it will do is it will bind to noradrenaline specific receptors that we call adrenergic receptors. They can be alpha one, beta one, alpha two, or beta two. Now, funnily enough, if noradrenaline binds to the alpha two or beta two, it inhibits them from having their function. If it binds to alpha one or beta one, it stimulates them to having their function. Now, let's just go back to this neuron that's producing noradrenaline. Once noradrenaline's been released, it can jump back into the neuron to be released again by something called reuptake one. So this is a mechanism that takes all the noradrenaline that's out in the synapse and throws it back into the neuron. Now what this does is it reduces the amount of noradrenaline available at the synapse, which reduces its effect on these particular receptors. So there's actually drugs that can inhibit this reuptake one mechanism. So one drug is cocaine. Cocaine inhibits reuptake one and that means that there's more noradrenaline floating out in the synapse and you get more stimulation of all these particular receptors. Some antidepressants as well, some uh, norepinephrine uh, reuptake inhibitor receptors, uh, uh, drugs can actually inhibit this particular process, okay? And such as the SNRI, serotonin noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors, also inhibit this process, leaves more noradrenaline out in the synapse and stimulates these receptors, okay? You can also have certain drugs that stimulate more noradrenaline to actually be released by these vesicles. It just tells more and more and more noradrenaline to be released. These are the amphetamines, so those party drugs. Okay, now let's look at these particular receptors and some common clinically uh, applicable medications that we use. So, first of all, if we look at alpha-1, remember the role of alpha-1 receptors is it stimulates, it stimulates all smooth muscle and organs and glands. So think of the smooth muscle. Where is smooth muscle? This is muscle that lines the inside of hollow organs. That includes our blood vessels, that includes our urinary tract, it includes our digestive tract as well. So if you stimulate alpha-1, it's going to constrict the blood vessels, it's going to constrict the uh, urinary um, vessels, so the, uh, the urinary tubes, so it's going to be the ureters and bladder. It's also going to constrict this smooth muscle within the gastrointestinal tract. 
Okay, so we've actually got drugs that we can stimulate this action. So why would we do that? Well, for example, mitodrine is a drug that's used to treat hypotension. That means your blood pressure is low. If your blood pressure is low, it means your blood vessels are too open. They're far too dilated. It means if they're too dilated, the blood pressure drops. Think of a hose. When you put your thumb on the end of a hose and narrow the hole of the hose, the water that comes out, comes out at a higher pressure. If you were to open up that hose, water's gonna come out at a lower pressure. So, if somebody has hypotension, blood vessels too open, we need to stimulate alpha-1, which leads to constriction of those blood vessels, and we treat hypotension. However, a side effect of this can be hypertension. And we've got nevazoline. Nevazoline's there to treat red eyes. Why red eyes? Well, remember, all smooth muscles, organs, and glands, it's going to be constricting those blood vessels within the eyes as well. And if you're gonna have red eyes, it means these blood vessels are opened up too much and the blood starts to leak out a little bit and we need to constrict those blood vessels again and we can do this with nephazoline. Again, a side effect of this could be blurry vision. Now, sometimes we need to inhibit alpha-1. Why would we wanna inhibit alpha-1? Well, maybe alpha-1's been stimulated too much normally. And if that's the case, remember what can happen is we may have high blood pressure. We may have urinary retention because the uh, smooth muscles in our urinary system are constricted, not letting urine come out. The bowels may be moving too slowly because the smooth muscle is constricted. So we've got alfuzacin, which is there for urinary retention. What it does is it, it inhibits, it's known as a blocker, an alpha-1 blocker. It blocks this from having its stimulatory effect and therefore the smooth muscles dilate in the urinary system. And so urinary retention is now mitigated, it's stopped. We've also got prazosin, it's there to treat hypertension. Again, if alpha-1 stimulated too much, it may have a, constrict, a constriction of the blood vessels. So we treat with prazosin and it can dilate those blood vessels and treat the hypertension. If we look at beta-1, so beta-1, when stimulated, it stimulates the cardiac cells, so the heart muscle cells, to contract. So it has a positive, what we call inotropic effect. So positive inotropic, inotropic means the contractile force of the heart. So we've got agonists of beta-1. So these agonists include dobutamine. Dobutamine, again, if it stimulates beta-1 receptors, it's gonna stimulate heart muscle cells to contract and therefore it in itself is a positive inotropic drug. It's also a selective beta-1, so it only works on the cardiac muscle cells and those cells of the juxtaglomerular apparatus. You're thinking, what the hell is that? This is part of your kidneys that releases a molecule called renin, and renin stimulates you to have high blood pressure, okay? So that means it helps, if you stimulate it, helps increase the contractile force of the heart, increasing blood pressure. Now we've also got isoprenaline, and it's not a selective beta-1, it actually stimulates beta-1 and beta-2, which means it tells the heart to contract harder, but also tells the airways, which is controlled by beta-2, to relax and open up. Why relax? Because beta-2 inhibits airways. Okay, we've also got antagonists antagonists of beta-1, so these are blockers, beta-1 blockers, such as atenolol and metoprolol, these are the lols. So beta blockers are the lols. Why would we want to block beta, beta-1 specifically? Because if we block beta-1, we're gonna calm the heart down, we're gonna slow it down, so it can be used to treat hypertension predominantly. Also can be used to treat uh, anxiety, this may be because of some of the central effects that it has. All right, let's move on to alpha-2. Alpha-2, if you stimulate it, it actually has an inhibitory effect. Strangely enough, if adrenaline's released and stimulates alpha-2 receptors, it inhibits all the presynaptic neurons for the sympathetic nervous system. So basically, if you stimulate alpha-2, it's gonna dampen down the effects of the sympathetic nervous system. So for example, agonists of alpha-2, such as clonidine, can be used to treat hypertension because it's gonna be reducing the effects of all the sympathetic nervous system uh, neurons. And it can be used for sedation because again, it's suppressing that sympathetic nervous system. We've got an antagonist. So mirtazapine can be used as an antidepressant. So if it's antagonizing or blocking alpha-2, it's inhibiting an inhibitor. So it activates the presynaptic neurons of all the sympathetic neurons, which means you have this overall sympathetic effect. 
and this overall positive sympathetic effect can be used to treat depression. Okay, if we look at beta 2, so beta 2 is located in all smooth muscles, organs and glands, but if you stimulate it, you actually inhibit it, funnily enough. So if noradrenaline is released, it inhibits all these smooth muscles, so tell smooth muscles to open up. And specifically, these are found in the, what do we have two of? B2, two lungs. So, if you have an agonist of B2, it inhibits the effects and opens up the airways. So we've got salbutamol and salmeterol. These are both used in asthma. Okay, so these are agonists of beta-2. So, for example, salbutamol is a short-acting um, beta-2 agonist, and salmeterol is a long-acting beta-2 agonist. Again, tells the airways to relax, open up, in times of asthma, for example. Now, sometimes if asthma is very bad and, they, and the airways are so closed up that they can't bring anything in, you may need to inject adrenaline, right? Or, or noradrenaline or epinephrine, for example, norepinephrine, because that's gonna have a total sympathetic effect and that's gonna relax those airways, but it'll also speed up the heart, for example, also increase blood pressure and so forth. Now, what about the antagonist of beta-2? Do we ever want to constrict the airways? No, not really, so we don't really have any drugs for that. So, wasn't very quick, but this is a run-through of drugs of the sympathetic nervous system.